Hello, and welcome to our online worship services for Mount Hebron Presbyterian Church for the 29th of November, 2020. This is the first week of Advent. We're very happy that you've come to join us, and we hope that you find this experience very rewarding. A couple of announcements before we get started. First, our Adopt an Angel and Retail Therapy toy drive is going currently ongoing. There's an email that you should have received uh, from yesterday at about 5.55 p.m., with details, but we're looking for toys this year to help uh, supplement the Christmas of some children that may be having some difficulties this year with their families, um, financial situations due to the pandemic. If you'd like to donate, please check out the email. We've got some online shopping options, and you can have the toys shipped directly to Ginny Yep, who will take care of getting them delivered properly. Additionally, our um, pastor nominating committee for our interim pastor is currently working. We're very proud to report that they're uh, currently uh, in the process of interviewing a first candidate. We're hoping that more candidates come in, and we're hoping that we uh, are able to discern what God's looking for us to do in this process. Hopefully, it won't take too much longer, uh, as this uh, we'd really like to get moving to the next stage of the process, which is working with the interim pastor to help the church prepare for our next long-term pastor. So, with those announcements out of the way, let's prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls for the preparation of worship for God's Word. On the first Sunday of Advent, the Advent wreath calls us to remember that the greatest gift ever given is the gift of God's Son and the salvation that He brings. Today we light the first candle, the hope candle. In the days of old when our ancestors were bonded in servitude to Pharaoh, or wandering the desert for a home, or struggling to make a way in the world, they kept alive hope that God's promises would still come true for them. We have the comfort of living after the Savior came. Jesus came to earth for us as God promised. The prophets of Israel all spoke of the coming of Jesus and how the Savior would be born in Bethlehem, a king in the line of David. However, we're in the same position currently. We're waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for his return. The prophet Micah prophesied, But as far as you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient times. And Isaiah prophesied, Therefore the Lord himself will give a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. As followers of Jesus, we await his return with hope. We remember that he came to us humbly in a manger at Bethlehem and gave light to all the world. So he is coming again in power to deliver his people. As we read through all the prophecies, we sometimes get a sense of the waiting and how hard it is to find our feelings as we wait. For a second, think about the difference in tone of Mark and the tone of Isaiah. There's a real starkness to them. Later on, Mark will remind us to be watchful and be alert, for no one knows when the Lord is coming. That's quite removed from the holiday sentiment to deck the halls or dream of a white Christmas. How many Sundays have we heard some form of the end is coming and we don't know the hour or the day, so always be mindful, and that we are told once again to be alert and wait for the coming of Jesus? But waiting is so hard for us who are used to having everything available now. Gigabytes of data coming from us all directions to us and no further away than the smartphones in our hands or our pockets. Same day delivery, deliveries for even our most trivial of orders. Reaction to every news event in real time with commentary we can choose to accept or refute or even engage in the discussion. From an early age we cry out, are we there yet on car journeys? And the days of Advent seem interminable when opening just one little window a day on the Advent calendar to count down the night before Christmas, when what we really want is the big presence under the tree. God's word on the first Sunday of Advent suggests that we are waiting for more than just Christmas. We are waiting for the day of the Lord. We are waiting for God to set things straight. We are waiting for God to clean up the messes we have made and to demonstrate the love and mercy that he has for us. 
The prophet Isaiah, whose dreams and longings provide inspiration to us in this season of anticipation, at times even sees, seems to be telling God to hurry up and get down here. And at times he even seems to be blaming God for what we have done. Quoting, How could you let this happen, God? Why did you let us wander from your ways? You seem far away, he implies. Again quoting, You, the potter, made us after all. We are the work of your hands. We can understand that in this time of year, maybe more so this year. The pandemic has left many of us feeling far from one another and, at times, falling far from our prayers that we are still waiting to be answered, and therefore feeling far from God. In these times, there are regular forms of waiting, waiting for a healing of a relationship, waiting for the healing of a family member in the hospital, waiting for the bad things to pass so the good things can come. These are not the visions of sugar plums dancing, but the kinds of waiting that Isaiah and Jesus describe, waiting for the bad things to pass so that the good things can come. And that is the hope that we need. It is Paul today who expresses the hope of the season, the joyful anticipation. He reminds us that despite being in the midst of a global pandemic, Despite the polarization of the human family continues to experience, despite the messes that we can manage to make, God is faithful. God will keep us firm to the end. God has given us all and all of his because God made us brothers and sisters in his son, Jesus Christ. We have so much to be hopeful for. And even though with Isaiah we cry out, quote, tear open these clouds and get down here, we know that God will, and God is worth the wait. So keep hoping, because God will keep his promises to us, just how he has in all the days of old, always. Amen. Today's first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verses 1 through 9. And today I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. And when the fires kindle brushwood, and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard no ear has perceived. No eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself. We transgressed. We have all become like the one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like the leaf, and all our inequities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us. You have delivered us from the hand of our inequity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hands. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and we do not remember inequity forever. Now consider we are all your people. So ends the reading from Isaiah. Our second reading today is from the book of Psalms, chapter 80, verses 1 through 7 and 17 through 19, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. This section is titled, Prayer for Israel's Restoration. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Masaniah. Stir up your might and come save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors, our enemies laugh among themselves. 
Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. But let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. And when then we will return back and never again from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. So ends the psalm. Our third reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks to my God always for you because the grace of God that has been given to you in Jesus Christ. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless among all others on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him we are called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So ends the letter. Our Gospel reading today is from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in heaven will be shaken. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out angels and gather his elected from the four winds and from the ends of the earth and from the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you will know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about this day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when this time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands, the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crow, or at the dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you all is this, keep awake. So ends the reading from the Gospel according to Mark. My grandfather was the son of a Welsh Baptist preacher. His father, my great-grandfather, settled in Frostburg, Maryland, not far away from Frostburg State University, and served as pastor at Welsh Memorial Baptist Church for decades. The church still stands on Beale Street in Frostburg, near the top of the city's highest hill, and there's a marker in their narthex in his honor. Reverend Reese and his wife, raised three children there during the Depression, all of whom were greatly devout religious people for their entire lives. Richard Blevin was my grandfather, and his sisters, Aira and Brawen, were my great aunts. All were the matriarchs and patriarchs of my family for a generation. Richard served so many terms on the diaconate of his home church that he developed the nickname Deacon, but I always called him Gramps. In the recent history of my family, they were the sources of our values, and even with that burden, instilling the values and morals of a large family upon the younger generation, they were very loved and very revered. Nearly every child of my generation bore a child and named them in honor of one of them, including me. My son was named Nicholas Blevin Reese in his honor. Growing up, there was something simple that happened at holidays that I am 
passing down to my children. Although I didn't know its importance back then, and I suspect they're just starting to see it now. We always had champagne on hand, and always served champagne at family holiday dinners. Somewhere in the house there was always a bottle, and when family gathered for Christmas, or Easter, or Thanksgiving, it was always served with dinner. To Gramps, you had to have champagne at all times, and you probably should keep it chilled. See, good things were going to happen, and when they did, you were going to want to celebrate with those who were close at hand. And part of that meant uncorking a bottle of champagne to make sure it was marked as a special occasion. Family holidays were more than enough reason to celebrate. He and his sisters were together with more than three generations of the family they had made. In those times, they could see the fruition of the things that they had always hoped for. Health, happiness, peace, prosperity, and love. Throughout history, we have had lots of hopes, but I think those five encompass all of the noblest we have for our families and ourselves every day. Health, for your mind, body, spirit, and soul to be strong enough to thrive, if not just survive. Happiness, to be satisfied with the world around you and optimistic that you continue to, can continue to make it a better and more sustainable place. Peace, to be surrounded by tranquility and comfort. Prosperity, to have enough to continue to survive, if not thrive. Love, to be surrounded by warm, enthusiastic, and benevolent attachments. These were their hopes and their prayers. With the extended family gathered under one roof to celebrate a Thanksgiving or, or Christmas or Easter, the three siblings could see all of it, the fruition of their hopes for health, happiness, peace, prosperity, and love. Everything that they'd hoped and prayed for in the years coming into place. And so, of course, it was time to break out the champagne. I'm no different than my grandfather in this way. I hope for the same things, and I celebrate them when I see them. Hope is easy when you can see it coming true. And celebrating comes easy because, well, we're getting what we wanted and what we hoped for and what we expected. The three siblings in those moments were like Mark from our reading. They got to see their hopes and dreams come true. Mark saw the Christ. It's pretty easy to have hope at those times, isn't it? But what about when we see things that aren't going the way we'd hoped? What about when we've been praying for what seems like an eternity and we still don't feel like God has answered our prayers yet because we just can't see it? That's where Isaiah finds himself. Isaiah proclaimed the prophecies in the 8th century B.C. Throughout the New Testament, his writings are cited as, See, here it is, just like Isaiah said it would be. But Isaiah never saw any of it. He had hope, but he never got to see any of it come true. That's the middle of the journey. There's even a lot of implication that he had a very hard time with hope, because so much of what was going on around him wasn't good, and so many didn't believe him. That's the hard part of the middle of the journey. It's easy to lose hope when things aren't going our way. But I'd say that maybe things just aren't going our way yet. Or not going the way we expected them to go. There's an old saying, we've all heard it, that says, If you want to see God laugh, tell him your plans. I don't think God actually laughs at us. But I am confident his plans are not our plans. But I think the end results are probably the same. He wants us to have health and happiness and peace and prosperity and love. But how we think we're going to get them isn't the same as how he planned for us to receive them. God has a tendency to throw things on their ear from our perspective. You want strength? God gives you opportunities to grow strong. The end result is still the same. 
you have the strength you prayed for. It just came with a little more sweat than you'd planned on. This year has not been what anyone was planning for, at least not any of us here on earth, but somehow it's still a part of God's plan. Now, I'm no expert on theology or disease or sociology or anything of that sort, but I can say that if I look hard, I can see the mechanism for our hope to come true and God's hand at work for most of it. We want health and we got a pandemic. But when was the last time you saw an entire society focused on hygiene? Hand washing, disinfecting surfaces, isolating when you feel ill. Surely those habits will, in the long run, improve all of our health. We want happiness and we got a pandemic. But when was the last time you saw an entire society with the time to find new ways to enjoy themselves, or at least the ability to try? As we've been through the last months, I've seen more people out walking than ever before, and many taking and sharing some of the most beautiful pictures of this world I've ever seen, and in common places where it's been missed before. Surely that will, in the long run, help to improve our happiness. We want peace, and we got a pandemic. But when was the last time you saw an entire society with the desire to have just a few words with their neighbors from across a fence or driveway? In these last few months, I've seen and participated in more simple talks with neighbors from a healthy distance than any other time because we were all looking for just a little bit of human contact amongst the isolation. But surely those opportunities will, in the long run, lead to better understanding, communication, and more peace. We want prosperity and we got a pandemic. But when was the last time you saw an entire society striving for the economic recovery of all? Now I'm not saying any form of economy is better than others or anything that's been put forth by any one of the politicians in the marketplace is the correct way to go. That's way past the scope of a Sunday sermon. But surely all of us thinking and talking and discussing on an economic recovery for all is bound to lead to more opportunities for prosperity for all. We wanted love and we got a pandemic. I, I don't know about this one. I'm lucky. I've spent a decade knowing I am surrounded by warm, enthusiastic, and benevolent attachments to my wife, my kids, and many friends. Yvonne and I have frequently noted that we are lucky and grateful to be stuck with one another through this because we are so warmly attached and we know what it's like to be in the opposite situation. And there are many people who are in the opposite situation. They are either so isolated that there is no one around, or worse, those who are around are not warm, benevolent, and compassionate. I don't know how God is working his plan for love in all of us through this pandemic, but surely he has a plan for it, and for sure he is at work. Until it's revealed to us, though, we're like Isaiah, hoping it will happen, maybe even struggling with doubt. Or we're like my grandfather in the Depression, wanting that family health and happiness and peace and prosperity and love, but seeing no way it could possibly come true in the middle of the Great Depression. It's hard to have hope now, just like it was hard for our forefathers to have hope, be them our ancestors during the Depression, or for Isaiah, who never got to see the promises fulfilled. But hope is what we need, so have hope in God. Have hope because God never broke a promise, not to Abraham, not to Noah, not to Moses, and not through any of us, not through Jesus. Have hope because before this year is done, Christ will come again. And again, God will work his plan in the most unexpected ways. 
by sending the King of all the world and of all heaven back to us as a helpless baby entering the world in the most humble of circumstances. Hope for him, prepare for him, and make him welcome, for he is coming, just as we hoped, and just like God promised. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, please help us with our hope this season. We are in the middle of your journey and in the middle of your plan. And sometimes it becomes difficult for us to see where this is going, how your promises will be kept, because it's not the way we expect it. Help us to remember, as we travel through this time, the way you kept your promise by giving us the baby who would become our Lord and Savior, coming into the world to be the king of all kings in the most humble of fashions and the most unexpected of ways. Help us to remember with hope that your promises are always kept, but just like with the baby Jesus, they come to us in ways we were not expecting. Be with us as we, your children, struggle to keep the hope alive in this unprecedented time when so many are without hope. Help us to be vigilant just as we look for the signs of your promises being kept, to look out for those around us who need a little extra this summer, this season, with compassion and love. And as we come together, be with us now as we pray as your Son taught us to, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now as we finish our services and go out into the world, remember to go forth with hope. God's promises are being kept. They just come true to us in the most unexpected ways. So keep your eyes open, look for them, and know that they're coming. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.